Hi there, welcome to our webinar this morning. My name is Belinda Dabston and I am Program Director for the Zadar Live Directorship Program. It gives me absolute pleasure to have you with us this morning as part of exploring some of the fascinating insights that we have gleaned about directorship and around growing companies over the many years that we've worked to train, develop and implement high performance boards. So today's topic we're going to focus on is a topic entitled The Seven Myths of High Performance Directorship and What You Really Need to Know. So I trust that you enjoy this session with me. I will go through two parts. One is talking about these seven myths and really unlocking some of the learning that we have had that I really want to share with you that should help you in every context that you're involved with. And then the second part, I'd like to introduce you to the Sadar Applied Directorship Program and give you some more insight as to what that entails, whether that might be something that you're excited about in the next step of your development journey. Life never stops and uh, our learning never ends. So what is your next step in your journey? So let's start with a really powerful thought. Good directors grow companies. Great directors change lives. Now in the Sadar group, our mantra, our promise, as it were, our reason for being is meaningful economic impact. We are of the belief that we cannot expect and we should not wait for governments to be the solution to uplifting economic poverty, financial and economic upliftment. It's not going to happen. It happens through businesses. It happens through companies growing and being prosperous and caring for their employees, growing and servicing the community well with the right intent and with the right social and environmental impact. So our view is that the most important thing that we could do as a dog, and perhaps you're part of that journey as well, is to grow and develop directors because a board is the head of the company. The board is the mind that guides and shapes the organization and its growth. If we create high performance boards and directors, we create high performance, high and high growing companies and those companies make an incredibly meaningful and powerful impact on their economies that they find themselves in. So that's the task ahead. This is not about sitting on boards and taking pieces of paper and moving, shuffling board papers around. This is about making a meaningful economic impact. And I really hope that as you listen to my words, that this is something that's as important to you as it is to us. So let's get cracking with our myths. And I hope I'm going to bust some myths for you this morning um, as part of really just sharing some of our insights and our, our approach and thoughts around what is a high performance board and what is a high performance director. What does it all mean? So our first myth I'd like to bust this morning is being a great director means compliance and boring legalese. And uh, I was uh, caught on an aeroplane reading the New Companies Act Unlocked, which is a textbook we use in the Applied Direction Program. And uh, the guy sitting next to me said to me, are you a lawyer? <laughs> I was like, no, I train directors. And so, you know, this is just another one of the multitudes of examples of where we see that people have a huge misconception around what being a director is all about, what high performance boards are all about. There really is this massive perception that it's compliance, it's tick lists, it's legal, it's accounting only, uh, that it's boring and it's, you know, it's all kinds of very complicated thoughts and understandings around that. So that is the myth that if you are sitting there thinking, I'm listening to this thing about governance and boards, I'm not really sure why I'm here because, gosh, it must be a boring subject. I hope that this opens your eyes to the reality of the situation. So what is that reality in our view? So we believe, and this is not just a world view according to Sadar Group, this is a view that is supported by some of the great thinkers around a lot of the codes and acts, for example, King Paul was part of the South African context, and so this is the idea. This is what a high performance board is about, driving the performance and the conformance of the company. So we tend to think conformance being that whole compliance element, but actually as a board, your task is to grow this company and to help it to prosper, to drive its performance, to create accountability for its team, to hold the company 
accountable to a higher standard than it has perhaps ever had before. So performance is an absolutely critical element of the board's role, of a director's role. And if you are a director, if you sign that little piece of paper that says, yes, I'm a director on the board, SIP C form, or whatever it is in whoever your country is, you know, this is a process that you are responsible for doing, driving performance. You can sit there all you like and make sure all the tick boxes and compliance have happened and all the forms are done. But that is just one small element of what performance and conformance and governance is all about. So really encourage you to think about the performance element. And what I'd like to do is share with you a, an image of a cross-country skier. If you've attended our High Performance Sports Workshop, this image and concept will not be unfamiliar to you. And a cross-country skiing is actually quite tough. It's harder than downhill skiing. Um, I think I've tried to uh, kill myself a couple of times downhill skiing. It's quite a treacherous thing. But cross-country skiing is quite a lot of work. You've got to keep on getting your legs moving. You've got to keep on moving. You can't stand still. It's the motion and momentum that you create. It's that rhythm of the left leg and the right leg that keeps you going across the landscape and allowing you to navigate from one place to the other. And what an incredible analogy for the process of a board, of consistency, of momentum, of habit, of routine, of driving, of focus, of knowing where you're going. But what's most important is that the left leg and the right leg work together. This is not a case where you can glide along the left leg, i.e. the conformance, or glide along the right leg, I mean the performance, or vice versa, if you're left-handed. So the idea is that when we ski, whether it's downhill or whether it's cross-country, the idea is that these two skis represent these two facets of performance and conformance. If you cross them over, if you lose the perspective between the two of them, if they are imbalanced, you have a skier that has, is being airlifted off the mountain because of a very bad leg break. So that is a wonderful way of understanding these two elements, performance and conformance. Certainly, our performance board and governance is not about boring degrees. Yes, there are important and critical things that every director must know, but actually they're not that scary and they're not that complicated. Yet, it's the performance and conformance element that we need to, that we need to bust the myth of, that actually it's about performance as much as it is about conformance. So what might be myth number two? So we have myth number two says, being a great director means great risk. And if you've been following the thread of thought since 2008 when uh, officially the, uh, the New Companies Act of 2008 was launched and then implemented effectively from 2011, you would have been following this conversation around all the personal liability for directors and you know you can't hide behind the company and and not have personal liability for your decisions and it's very risky to be a director and it's complicated. Uh, you know, actually is that really true? Yes, there is a high level of standard that the New Companies Act calls upon for us to adhere uh, to, but what is the reality? Of that risk. So one of the interesting things that I wanted to share with you is that literally the New Companies Act is a completely new way of looking at companies. If you are not from South Africa and you have other forms of legislation, you obviously have to work with the legislation that you have, but the South African Companies Act in some quarters of the world is considered to be quite revolutionary, you know, considering its approach to the stakeholder inclusive model, uh, creating opportunities for directors to be held personally liable, and what it is asking directors to do. There's a codified set of directors' duties that is within the Act. This is something new for us. So it is a totally new way of looking at companies. It asks us to take responsibility, and it asks us to be very absolutely conscious around the decisions we make. So a cornerstone of the Companies Act says, that as a director, one of the things that you're doing, and remember, a director is also a prescribed officer, so make sure you know that even if you are a, a senior manager or a general manager within your organization, there's a good chance you're considered to be a director, so you can't you know, hide behind that. <laughs> so uh, it's your, your deemed activity. So you know, as part of this, this process, we are expected to you know, understand what it is that is the quality of a good decision. As directors, that is what we're there to do, is to make powerful decisions 
that grow and accelerate the sustainable performance of the company in which we serve. So making decisions is something we have to be really, really good at. And the Companies Act is expecting us to make great decisions. So in the Companies Act are a whole lot of requirements that we need to firstly act in the best interest of the company first. Uh, and also that we you know, exercise the duty of care, skill and diligence and we and honor our fiduciary duty which is to look after the company as if we were a father to a child or a parent to a child. That's what fiduciary means. So it's asking us to do that. And it says that it's not about the decisions you make or the outcomes of the decisions you make. That, that is one aspect. What's more important is how you made a decision, the quality of your decision-making process. So for example, if you made a decision and you were rash, or you didn't take into account all the data, or you made assumptions and didn't check your assumptions, or you didn't bother to prepare for the board meeting and you made the decision anyway, what is the quality of a decision-making process? And if that process causes harm and a stakeholder decides to claim against that, is to hold you personally responsible, if a shareholder decides to hold a director responsible for their decisions, then you have a problem. Yes, there is great risk. Yet the Companies Act also provides so many tools for us to understand and work with. And a lot of those tools are brought into the Star Group Board Services methodology. Things like how you minute your board meetings, how you understand and work through conflicts of interest, how you you know go through a process of assessing solvency and liquidity in critical decisions. So there are wonderful tools that are at your disposal. The problem is we just don't know what our tools are. <laughs> so yes, if you haven't made the effort to go and develop your skills as a director, you know, uh, yes there is great risk. So come on, get on with it and get those skills up. So when I say director, it does not matter that you are the only director of a company you founded and you're working from a converted garage in your home and you've signed that city form as a director and it's just to get a company so you can get a back number. Whatever it might be, you are still a director of the company. You still have stakeholders who have a vested interest in your well-being and the company's well-being and should you make bad decisions that impact them, they have a right for recourse. So this is not about you know <laughs> hiding hiding in the garage. This is actually about real life stuff. And so I often say that being a director is like when you sign that SIPTI document, you should get a little gift back <laughs> from from the company registrar that says, right now you're a director. Please sign in your pack gum guards, mini guards, deep heat, uh, some microdolls, and you know burn shield and a whole lot of other resources that are going to get you through this because it's a wonderful thing. Yes, it is an interesting and full-on experience. It's not something you dabble in. So you know, working with it, if there is great risk. If you don't know what you're doing, there's great risk. If you've invested some time in your development as a director, even if you are the only director of the company you founded, there's still great risk if you haven't done that development. So myth number three that I'd like to share with you this morning is that being a great director means loads of letters after your name. MPC, P545, you see some people's business cards, it's like, wow, did you do anything else other than study? And so this myth says, do you need to be highly, highly qualified and really, 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 really clever in order to be a director? And let's understand what this really means. Okay, so in this myth, and we say that in the boardroom, IQ is useful, IQ is very useful, Yet EQ is fundamental. So it does help to have a level of mental curiosity and understanding of the world and intelligence and questioning mind that wants to learn and unpack and resolve. You've got to have that. But around the boardroom table, the emotional intelligence of the people, the emotional intelligence of the group actually is the game changer. So you know, if you have a group, your board around the table, and everyone is working like a unit, like a team, emotionally intelligent, understanding each other, being a unit, thinking as one, the individual differences in IQ around the table actually, are they really that important? What's important is that we're making great decisions and we're engaging as a team. Yes, you have to make great decisions. You have to ask and analyze and understand 
seek to understand, seek to be understood. Those things are all part of it. Yet, your ability to relate to the people around the boardroom table is absolutely critical. So, when we think about being a director, one of the things I really have to tell you, one of the things that's in that little gift pack that we get from the registrar should be a little mirror. And in that mirror, whenever we are engaging with other people, we should think about the mirror and say, I reflect back on my performance. I'm exceptionally critical of my performance as a director. Every board meeting, I reflect on what I've contributed, what was my value. I look at myself in the mirror and say, did I make a meaningful economic impact to this company today? And if not, why not? And what do I do in the next round to take it to the next level? What can we do to make a bigger impact through this company? What, is, what do we have to do? Do we have to raise the level of promise? Do we have to create a bigger vision? What is it that we have to do using our EQ, using our group mind, as it were, and our difference and our diversity in that group mind to take it to the next level? What have we accomplished as a board? At the end of every board, we have a board women's section in our agenda. And our, our client companies are... <laughs> Forced. Think about what was the win? And if we all stare at each other and you haven't got a win out of a board meeting, if they, you don't feel at the end of the board meeting that, oh my goodness, this was the most valuable four hours we have ever spent, if that is not what's happening, the mirror, take the mirror out, put the virtual down, take the mirror up and say, why did we not have this feeling at the end of the board meeting that this was a game changing moment? It's a lot of pressure to create that new board meeting. And like all relationships, things go up and down. Sometimes this board meetings are really uncomfortable, where a lot of conflict is brought up, and other times it's a lot easier and more creative in this flow. Yet at the end of the day, have we engaged with each, with each other on a high level of intelligence that has emotional intelligence that has brought about an outcome and have I been exceptionally critical of my contribution? The next myth, number four, says being a great director means Pitching for the board meetings. I know that there are many people who have this perception that in these large corporate board meetings, everyone arrives and it's good coffee and then there's mumbling about the quality of the muffins and the snacks. <laughs> and everyone sits down and listens to the, you know, someone going on and on. Um, and your task is to arrive for the board meeting and, and sit there and do what you need to do. So what we're going to blow away is that being a great director means pitching for the board meeting. And what I'd like to share with you is a concept that's a little bit different that says the selfless service of a director is a 24-7 commitment. Now, let's just take a couple of steps back and talk about the shareholder. When you wear the shareholder hat, when you are a shareholder, essentially, if you're wearing that shareholder hat well, you have a selfish intent. In other words, you're putting money in, you're putting something into the organization in order to get a return. Okay. So I'm not saying selfish with any charge on the word, that it's wrong or right. I'm saying that's what a shareholder's responsibility is. They put something in, they need to get something out. The bank gives you a loan, they expect the loan to come back with interest. It's the same kind of idea. A director, on the other hand, is expected to be selfless because as a director, the Companies Act specifically says you need to act in the best interest of the company at all times. So if you are a shareholder, and this is where it gets really interesting, if you are a shareholder, what we call you wear a shareholder hat, and you are a director and you wear a director hat, which normally means you also wear the manager hat in some kind of executive function, even if a decision means that your investment will decrease or your return through dividends will decrease, but it's in the best interest of the company wearing the director hat, you will do it anyway. And this is something we see a big problem in private companies. Usually one of the big conflict areas is that maybe the founder or major shareholder of the business has, owns a property and the business operates from the property. And then there's a big discussion around uh, lease agreements and rentals. Maybe the rent is above par, maybe it's below par. Uh, but there's all kinds of weird conditions related to it. And then you start having a bit of a debate around, well, actually my property is going to be worse off because of this, so therefore I'm going to throw my weight around because I'm the property owner and I'm the shareholder hat. And actually as a director, you've got to make a decision, maybe this isn't a great place to have your company premises. 
So think about the director hat. Think about that role of self-service that you have to make decisions that are in the best interest of the company. And when we see private companies, especially family businesses, where a major shareholder is the founder, the managing director, uh, you know, on a board, if there is a board, uh, this is a big problem. How do you wear these hats really well? This is something that we focus on. If you can get three hats right of shareholder, director, and manager, you can fundamentally change the way an organization grows. You can accelerate its performance. So that's the one aspect of this myth. The second part is that it's a 24-7 commitment. So in other words, being a director, when you sign a piece of paper, it's a SIPC form, it doesn't say I'm a director from 8 to 5 or I'm a director once a month for four hours. I am a director. So whereas a manager it doesn't necessarily have to arrive at the raid on the premises in the middle of the night by the hawks. <laughs> As a director, uh, you certainly would be expected to jump in your car and go and go and support. And, you know, it's a small example, but it aims to illustrate this idea that you are a director all the time. And when there's a crisis, even if it's not in a board meeting, you've got to get involved wearing your director hat, remembering not jumping down into manager hat and going into operational mode, but as a director, making great and high quality decisions related to the growth of the business or whatever the crisis is. So the selfless service of a director is a 24-7 commitment. Myth number five says being a great director means being accountable to shareholders. Now virtually in your mind, obviously I can't see putting my hand up, but if you believe this to be true, just do a little <laughs> wiggle of a hand. That you know, surely a board, what a board must do is a board must deliver a return to shareholders. Surely that's what a board is for. Why would a board be there for anything else? And we're going to bust that up. And what I'd like to share with you is a story that we heard from Professor Mervyn King. We approached him to write the forward for Carl Bates' book entitled Traversing the Avalanche. And the, the book is really focused on the practical implementation of the high performance board in privately held companies and family businesses. And he went through and read the book and he came back to our horror and said, I'm sorry, I cannot write a board for your book because there are some fundamental problems. And we went, panic. <laughs> but what he did was graciously sat down and went through with them piece by piece. And one of the things he said is we referred throughout the, the first that draft of the book uh, to the concept of business owner. And he says a company is a juristic person, it exists as its own entity, as its own person under law, and just as you cannot own a human being, so too can you not own a business. So he says in our modern lexicon there's this notion of business owner, the moment we become aware of it we sort of you know, become so consciously aware of when someone uses the word business, term business owner, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard, <laughs> and, and so we've worked with this idea of the correct term as a shareholder manager, someone who either is the major shareholder or founding shareholder who's also a manager in the business and is usually the director on a piece of paper as well. So you cannot own a business just as you cannot own a human being. So coming back to this idea that Professor Mervyn King shared with us is that the company, or the board rather, is not accountable and this is where words become really important and critical, are not accountable, is not accountable, to shareholders. The board is accountable to the business company itself, to the person known as the company. So that is why within our legislation we have this thing of act in the best interest of the company, because that's what a director is responsible to do, not an act, act in the best interest of the shareholder, and so obviously in large corporates, particularly the USA, you see a big focus on shareholder model where the business exists only to put money in the pockets of the shareholders and actually directors are, in our country, are responsible for doing what's in the best interest of the company and meeting the reasonable expectations of the stakeholder community, shareholders obviously being a primary group within that community. But it's also not just about worrying about shareholders, but worrying about the greater stakeholders as well. Is there a community that you impact? You know, what what is the the um, the impact and responsibility to the licensing bodies that you involve with? What are the greatest stakeholders who have a vested interest in the well-being of the company? 
Myth number six says being a great director means having big corporate board experience. Think back to the image I shared with you, this long boardroom table of, you know, maybe it's 12, 12 to 18 directors all sitting with their delicious snacks and their good coffee. <laughs> and we have this perception that if we could just get a great you know, corporate director who's been in a multi, multi, multi billion uh, um, rand or dollar business, you know, on our board, that would be amazing. But actually, in reality, I can tell you our experience is that a large corporate director does not make it <laughs> necessarily a great director for a privately held company and family business. And the reason being is the level of involvement. Remember that little uh, welcome kit with the gum guard and the <laughs> burn shield? You know, as a private company director, there is no room to be a specialist. You can't sit on a board and be a technical specialist in human resources as a director. You have to be a generalist. You have to be a director. You have to develop your ability to serve as a director. And that means in a private company, getting stuck in, rolling your sleeves up and getting stuck into the nitty gritty of the financial statements, the business model, the team, how does the leadership structure work, what is the culture of the organization, how are the stakeholders engaging and and what is the value that we need to create in five years' time? What's the next stakeholder we have to worry about in five, you know, now because we're going to need them in five years' time? Being a director of a private company is a hands-on experience. It is a full, fully involved, fully engaged, you know, life experience. And we have to have a diversity of skills. We have to be generalists, and we need to develop this capacity to serve. And we talk about this idea of commercial acumen. So in a private company, demonstrated commercial acumen is everything. All the degrees, the letters, the technical experiences, speciality focus uh, is really not going to cut it in a private company. And you know, I've done interviews with for our Sadar Governance panel, I've interviewed directors, uh, beautiful CVs, lots of experience. I almost felt like a little bit you know awkward to interview them and ask them these questions. And then we got to the financial results section of the interview and I said, okay, please give me an example of how you've created value through the analysis, interrogation, and financial statements. And there was a silence. I said, no, there's an accounting team that does that. <laughs> and that's the point, isn't it? <laughs> In a private company, it's you because as a director, you have to get fully involved. And the lifeblood of the organization is the financial performance. You might not necessarily have to know how to, how to produce consolidated uh, you know, financial statements, you know, doing the doing, you know, someone else is doing the doing. What you're doing is you're looking at them and you're looking for the story. What is the story that the numbers are saying? Where are the, where are the weird variances? Where are things that don't make sense? Where are numbers going up where they should be going down? And it's a, having that perspective, especially if you're an independent director, of looking at something that you're not involved with on a day-to-day -day basis. You don't have a personal attachment and you're not having to cover stuff up, and you're asking what seems like silly questions, but actually are always important. And so that ability, that commercial acumen, understanding all the facets of a business and all the elements that, that it takes to grow business, sales and marketing, building teams, you know, understanding IT and being agile, understanding you know, uh, our modern era and all the dynamics that are taking place in technology and innovation having understanding of financial performance and innovation as well as well as knowledge management and operational excellence. We have to develop our skills in a very broad way because that is how we build commercial acumen. Commercial acumen is our demonstrated ability to apply our mind, our intelligence, emotional and intellectual, whatever level you've got, to apply our intelligence to create value and unlock the potential of the company on which we serve. The last myth I want to share with you, and there are others that I just didn't have time to put on here because there are so many, is myth number seven, that being a great director means that you founded the company or have executive experience. I can tell you how many times <laughs> we have heard the saying, well, they don't understand my business. I know the business and the industry better than anybody. How are they going to come in here and add value if they don't understand what I'm doing? They're involved in a totally different industry. How will they know what I'm doing? And the ego, oh my goodness. So being a great director, we're saying, is not about the fact that you founded the company or that you have executive experience. 
So what is it? Now one of the things we say is that business degrees do not teach you about directorship and neither does managing your business. So this is an interesting thought for us to think about. I can share with you in my own career, I did a Bachelor of uh, Commerce Honours degree, the accounting, chartered accounting stream, I changed to information systems on, on, uh, in my honours year. And um, I left that, that degree learning how to think, which is I think a very powerful process for tertiary education. I'm not, uh, I love tertiary education, so don't get me wrong on this. But I left, firstly, not knowing how to create and build a business because later when I tried it was really hard. And then that's when I really realized actually I wasn't equipped with a business degree to build a business. I was equipped to be a great employee, totally different skill set. And the second thing is years later when I came across and met Carl Bates and I joined the Sadar team, I realized they don't teach you stuff at university <laughs> either. What are we doing there? So, so you know, you don't leave the university learning the principles and processes of being a director. Yes, I remember studying the Companies Act in 1973 version. Uh, yes, I'm going to memorize this entire textbook. But did I learn skills that would equip me to serve as a great director? And surely, great directors are the future of our economy. So there's some work to do in our education institutions. So I can tell you from personal experience, business degrees do not teach you about directorship and neither does managing a business. Now the second part might be a little controversial for you. If you have founded a business and you're listening to this webinar and you've grown a business and you've grown skills and you've gone on courses and you've committed to a learning, and I really applaud that. What I'm trying to say is that we tend to think that because we've run a business, that we develop directorship skills. And actually, being a director is so different from being a manager. And when we get so involved in the operational detail of an organization, especially when we found it or we have an emotional investment in it, we tend to lose perspective on what being a great director really is all about. And we tend not to make the tough decisions that we should. So being in a business, you might have built up a business you know, at, the, at the end of the day when we have a board and you have to sit in the board meeting and keep the director hat on, in other words, not bring the manager hat into the board meeting, uh, we, we've seen with our own eyes the struggle and difficulty. So it does mean that we have to reach out to some form of education and I really would encourage you to think about perhaps within our process of developing skills and focusing on practical directorship, maybe you'll find a home with us and find your way through it through our program. So one of the things that we is really coming out of the need to create a very clear model of what a high performance board is all about. And uh, our model informs a, a core or core, it's fundamental to traversing the avalanche as our reference material, our seminal work on this topic, and takes us through eight dimensions of governance and high performance boards and really unpacks, obviously there's just one, this is just the model in front of you, it's not the whole context, it really unpacks the different facets of what it means to be a director and the things that we should pay attention to. So now that we've covered through and focused on the seven myths of high performance directorship and we talked a little bit around having a model or having a reference point that can and shall we cover inclusively all aspects of High Performance Board. I'd like to share with you next one of my favorite sayings, which is, if you only have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. This is a quote from the famous Maslow of the pyramid frame. Of the, <laughs> and he talks about this idea that if you have a limited toolkit, you approach things from a very, you see things from a particular point of view in a very limited way. So I really encourage you to think about your path as a director, what it means to you, and what are you willing to do to make a commitment to that process. If you'd like to join us as part of our Sadar Applied Directorship Program, if it is something that draws you and is interesting for you, what I'd like to do next is share a little bit around this program and what it all means. We have a number of programs that run throughout the year. Our programs are practical and experiential and run over 10 months. So every single month you'll attend class or a session for four hours. And um, in between sessions there are 
loads of resources and exercise and activities that we ask you to do as part of developing your experience. Time of class is interactive, questioning, experiential, case study based, and simulation driven. And in between that is the foundation of your learning journey. And so we run everything through both a simulation program as well as an online e-learning system with video materials, reading resources, and other interesting things to support your journey. So let's get into a little bit more what it entails. So firstly, there is a technical element. You know, going climbing up a mountain and reaching Everest has technical competency required. And so too is being a director. We've spoken some of the requirements of understanding the company's act and our director's duties and fulfilling and acting in the best interest of the company. And so we get into the technical part. There is that there and we try and make we do make that as interesting and accessible to you as possible. We use a book called The New Company That's Unlocked, which is a very practical interpretation of the company's act. So we don't get you to read the act, we get you to read an interpretation and then we interact and discuss that and share and unpack what that really means for us. So there is a technical element indeed. Another part of it is equipping you with tools. So if we have the right tools in our tool book, too well, something other than a hammer, we can be better directors. And so we're going to give you tools to really take the mystery out of being a director and say, you know, this is what a set of minutes should look like. This is what a board calendar is. This is what, you know, should go into your board papers. This is an expedition update or strategic dashboard. We're going to cover those elements and give you the tools that you feel confident and understand what is expected of a director. And I think at a much higher level than you know, an average director might even have. Then the experience part. So part of this journey is experiencing being a director. It's, it's a doing subject. So for modules 3 to 10, or classes or sessions 3 to 10, we incorporate within the group boards of four to six directors. So you'll be on a board, and we incorporate the board based on your natural energy and as many diversity principles as we can. You'll learn more about the contribution compass as our tool of choice for that as we go along the process and you go into your boards and your boards are three or four companies within a market all manufacturing and selling the same commodity item and so the other companies will become your competitors in a market that uh, is quite flatlined or the competitors are equal and off you go on a journey of not having to grow your company as directors it's not a management task you sit in a board meeting and you go through the process of preparing a board, a longer theme, just as you would in one of our SODAR boards, and you have a board meeting. It's all turn to be the chairman, to follow the chairman script, and go through developing your skills and abilities. And as you track along, you'll start to see how the companies are performing, and you'll start to get a real insight on how you're performing as a board, what are some of the characteristics of the board, and how does it impact the quality of the outputs. One of the examples I'd like to share with you in one of our classes, we had three companies and in a particular board uh, round, we had one company where all five of the board members attended the class or the session for that day. The other two groups were missing quite a few members. The group that had five members, every single member had prepared. The other two groups, a significant portion of the groups hadn't prepared. And what you could see in the output from that simulation, once you punched all the numbers in and the decisions into the simulator, you could see the board that was prepared and all in attendance had suddenly shot up ahead of the other two companies. These are the types of things. This is a real world stuff where you realize if you aren't prepared, you don't fulfill your duty of diligence and become prepared and come interrogating with questions and working well as a board, cohesive busy unit, you've got some problems. So there's a huge experiential process. I want you to finish the journey and walk into your first board meeting, even if you're a bit nervous, ready and prepared for the first board meeting and knowing what should be there and holding your board to a higher level of standard. The personal growth element is a huge part of this journey. You know, remember the example of the mirror. We hold up the mirror, what do we see? And so personal growth is a huge element that will bring and is included as part of every single module we ask you to reflect on your own development on different facets of you as a director, we even get you to upgrade your LinkedIn profile. It's really about stepping up your game as a, as a, as a person, as an, an EQ member around that boardroom table. And then the fifth element is the impact that you make, really focusing us on developing our ability to create impact to your commercial acumen. A powerful process, many other features over and above those five, but just to give you a taste of what the program is to be around. 